Hello, welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam. I'm your host tonight, Bill Dixon, Vietnam 6768. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we hope you uh, are entertained and get some uh, uh, education out of tonight's show. We're going to be talking about uh, some of the women who, who served in Vietnam. We have done a show uh, from a symposium we did about the women who served, but these are the uh, eight of the women who we have talked about in the past are on the uh, Vietnam Memorial Wall in D.C. Now, what you need to do is go out and tell all your friends to either go in on Skype, that's Computers 2K Voice, as you see there on the screen, uh, and tune in and be part of the show, or 919-518-9773, uh, and be part of the show. If you have a message you need to get to me about an idea of who would be, should be a good guest or a good subject, uh, just send me an email at lessonsofvietnam at ncvi.org, and we'll see what we can do about getting that show done your way. Okay, next screen. What we're going to talk about, as I mentioned before, is the eight women on the wall and other distinguished women of the Vietnam War. Uh, there was a lot of uh, distinguished women of the Vietnam War. Uh, they were not all military. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about those eight. We're also going to be talking about some of the others. We uh, by, There's no way we got all of them. There are several I had in mind that uh, did great things in Vietnam but just didn't have enough time in the show to have it all done. Uh, there are eight women, as I mentioned a while ago, that are listed on the wall in D.C. They were all volunteers, they were all nurses, and they all gave all. There were seven Army nurses and one Air Force nurse. And as you can see right there, not all women wore love beads in the 60s. The first one we're going to be talking about is from uh, North Carolina native, Lieutenant Colonel Ruth Graham. She was chief nurse at 91st Evacuation, Evacuation Hospital in Tuiwa. Colonel Graham from Eflin, North Carolina, as you can see, suffered a stroke in August 1968. She was evacuated to Japan, and she died there. She was a, a veteran of both World War II and Korea, and she was 52 years old. And in the bottom, you can see that she's on 48 West, line 43. Now, that's how the wall is set up. To you, If you're facing the wall with the uh, Lincoln, excuse me, with the Washington Monument to your right, that is the east side of the wall. And on the left side of the wall would be the west side of the wall. And she's on the wall at panel 48 west, and she's on the wall at line 43. They're not listed on the wall by uh, alphabetical order as, as much as they are by date of casualty. And then for that particular day, they're in alphabetical order. So as we go through and talk, we can uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the next one we're going to be talking about is the young lady, 2nd Lieutenant Elizabeth A. Jones. She was at the 51st Field Hospital, attached 3rd Field Hospital, 68th Medical Group. That's a mouthful in itself. We still haven't got through. 44th Medical Battalion Army, uh, 18 February 1966. She was from Allendale, South Carolina. Uh, Lieutenant Jones was assigned to the 3rd Field Hospital in Saigon. She died with Lieutenant Elizabeth Drasbar in a helicopter crash near Saigon. Both were 22 years old. And you can see what panel she was on. Now, the other one that killed in that same crash was Second Lieutenant Carol Ann Elizabeth Drasbar. She was assigned to the 51st Field Hospital, attached 3rd Field Hospital, 68th Med Group. Uh, she was from Dunmore, Pennsylvania. Uh, Lieutenant Drasbar and Lieutenant Jones were assigned to the 3rd Field Hospital in Saigon, and they died in a helicopter crash near Saigon, February 18, 1966, which is early in the war. And you can see what panel that she's on early in the war would be 5 East, line 46. And this next one is the only one that was killed of the eight women that was the only one that was killed by combat. Um, her name is First Lieutenant Sharon Ann Lane. Lieutenant Lane died from shrapnel wounds when he... 312th Evacuation Hospital at Chula was hit by rockets on June 8, 1969. She was from Canton, Ohio. She was one month short of her 26th birthday. She was possibly awarded the Vietnamese Gallant Cross with Palm and, a, and Bronze Star for heroism. In 1970, the recovery room at Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver, where Lieutenant Lane had been assigned before going to Vietnam, was dedicated to her honor. 
but uh, she is, uh, was a special young lady, and uh, she was the only one that was killed by actual combat. Now, when we talk about the helicopters that crash or whatever, uh, don't have the details whether that was shot down or just a helicopter uh, crash because of mechanical problems. Uh, they don't bother to tell me that. Uh, the next young lady is Captain Grace Alexander. She was at 85th Evac Hospital, uh, Army of the United States. She was uh, killed 30th November 1967. She was in Riverdale, New Jersey. Rivervale, New Jersey. I can't even read my own writing there. Uh, Captain Alexander of Westwood, New Jersey, and Lieutenant Olansky of Detroit, Michigan, died 30th, November 30th, 1967. Alexander stationed at 85th Evacuation Hospital and Olansky stationed at the uh, 67th Hospital in Quinion had been sent to a hospital in Pleiku, which was in the, right at the Central Highlands, to help out doing a push. In other words, they had a lot of wounded. Um... With when, when the plane crashed on the return trip at Quinion were two other nurses, Jerome E. Olmsted of Clintonville, uh, Wisconsin, and Kenneth R. Shoemaker, Jr. of Owensburg, Kentucky. Alexander was 27, Olensky 23. Both were posthumously awarded the Bond Star. So you see these ladies were uh, out uh, in the elements, uh, flying back and forth from where they needed to be. Uh, they were always on the red, on the go. Uh, this next one is Lieutenant Diane Olowski. Uh, sound like a good Polish name there. Uh, she was killed, as we already mentioned, the 30th November 1967 from Detroit, Michigan. She was with Captain Alexander, and they were both uh, killed in the uh, helicopter crash, excuse me, the airplane crash, coming back from uh, uh, helping out and play coup. Uh, the next lady is Lieutenant Pamela D. Donovan, 85th Evacuation Hospital, 44th Medical Brigade, which most of them are. Then they went to the assigned units. Uh, from uh, she was killed 8th of July 1968. Now here it says she was from Brighton, Massachusetts. Uh, actually, she got her citizenship so that she could be a Army nurse. Uh, she became seriously ill and died on July 8, 1968. She was assigned to the 85th Evacuation Hall in Quinion. She was 26 years old. But as it says here, Ireland-born Lieutenant Donovan became a U.S. citizen so that she could join the Army Nurse Corps. She attended schools in Ireland, England, and Canada. The Newton County Day School alumni graduated from St. Elizabeth's Hospital of Nursing and became a registered nurse in 1965. So she went through a whole lot to be to volunteer to go to Vietnam, uh, and so forth. And the next one we're talking about is Air Force Captain Mary Therese Clinker. Captain Clinker was a flight nurse assigned to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. She was on the C-5A Galaxy, which crashed on April 4th outside Saigon while evacuating Vietnamese orphans under the Operation Baby Lift program, which we're going to go into a little bit later. She was from Lafayette, Indiana. Captain Clinker was 27. She was posthumously awarded the Airman's Medal for Heroism and Meritorious Service Medal. Now, there was a lot of, um, of ladies that were uh, women who served in Vietnam who were uh, killed, as we're going to go into an Operation Baby Lift a little bit. But as you look at these ladies uh, who served as nurses, uh, they also had to spend times uh, in bunkers, uh, which were not exactly the best places to be. They were under uh, the same bombardment. They had the same hardships as the men had to go through as far as conditions, uh, heat, humidity, smells, uh, people trying to kill you day and night with rockets and mortars coming in. So uh, they uh, just were not just serving there as nurses. They also had to go through the same environments that the men had. And quite often, as you see, they were on the go constantly. Uh, they could be working, uh, have a day off, and all of a sudden they were assigned to another unit somewhere else in Vietnam, which they had to travel to and take care of the wounded there. Now, the eight names listed on the uh, Vietnam Memorial Wall, those represent the military. They were not the only women to lose their lives in support of the United States Vietnam War. There were other ladies who uh, served uh, our troops and our country, and 
I'm going to give you their names in a little bit, and there were different organizations. Civilian. Don't know exactly what she was doing there. There was lots of different programs she could have been involved with. But the first one we're going to be talking about is Hannah E. Cruz died in a Jeep accident, Benoit, October 2nd, 1969. Uh, don't exactly know what the accident was, but Benoit was the air base, which was right next to Long Ben. Long Ben being the largest military installation uh, in the war, uh, actually in the world at the time. She was killed by uh, in a, an accident. Uh, Virginia E. Kirsch, murdered by a U.S. soldier in Coochie, August 16, 1970. Uh, don't know any of the circumstances of that. Coochie, uh, give you an idea where that is, that's where the a big tunnel complex was that was under the camp at Coochie. Uh, the next young lady was Lucinda J. Richter, died of Gillian... Bar syndrome in Cameron Bay, February 9th, 1971. Uh, I was going to look up that um, disease so I could tell you all about it and run out of time. So if you know what the disease was, give us a call, 919-518-9773, and tell us about that syndrome. Or even that, go to Computers 2K Voice on Skype and tell us all about that, uh, that disease. It, I've heard of it before. Uh, Cameron Bay was a very large uh, Navy and Air Force Bay uh, area. It was almost like being in the stateside. The next one we have is Armored Special Services, and Rosalind Muscat died in another Jeep accident in Long Bend in 1968. Dorothy Phillips died in a plane crash in Quinion in 1967. Uh, as you can see, they, uh, the a lot of ladies were traveling around uh, doing different things, and uh, uh, the planes and the helicopters were, uh, kept falling out of the sky. Uh, the next one was uh, she worked for the Catholic Relief Services. Her name is Gloria Redland. She was shot in Pleiku in 1969. Now, you get the idea that she was probably shot by an American soldier. It doesn't say... But Pleiku was a pretty good-sized place. I can't see a whole lot of Viet Cong or uh, North Vietnamese soldiers uh, in, right around Pleiku, but there's always that possibility. Now, everybody has a favorite organization, the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. Betty Gephardt died in Saigon in 1971. Barbara Robbins died when a car bomb exploded outside the American embassy in Saigon in March 30th, 1965. So we had ladies in Vietnam long before it got popular. The next one is United States Agency for International Development. That was uh, an aid group, semi-military in its uh, intent. It was the idea to go in and give uh, the Vietnamese uh, education as far as uh, growing extra rice and doing a bit of everything, building buildings and uh, hygiene and this sort of stuff. And this lady, Dr. Bream Ratterman, died in a fall from a balcony in Saigon, October 2nd, 1969. Now, it doesn't say whether she'd have been in, uh, inebriated or she got sick or somebody pushed her. It just says that she fell off a balcony. Uh, but she was killed uh, in, there in Saigon, a lot of balconies in Saigon. The next lady with that same group was Marilyn L. Allen. She was murdered by a U.S. soldier in Nha Trang, 16th of August, 1967. One of the original groups there in Vietnam as far as engineering and setting up for all the troops coming in was the United States Department of Navy, OIC, officer in charge of construction. Uh, the initial construction going on in Vietnam uh, when we first started to uh, send more troops in. We had to have a place for them to stay. Uh, so the uh, United States Department of Navy uh, was the ones that was in, uh, in control of all the construction going on and so forth, getting materials there and so forth. If you remember my show back from about engineers, that was, uh, we talked about it then. Uh, Regina or Reggie Williams died of a heart attack in Saigon in 1964. Okay. Now, 
everywhere you went in Vietnam, there was somebody with a microphone or a notebook or something, a journalist. And this was probably one of the most uh, famous uh, journalists uh, that you uh, hear about in Vietnam, uh, Georgette Dickie Chappelle. Uh, Dickie went out with the troops. She uh, went through all the hardships out with the swamps and the jungles and um, mosquitoes and the bugs, just like the troops and so forth. And uh, she was right there with them. And one of the reasons that she was killed by a mine while on patrol with the Marines outside of Chula, November 4th, 1965. She was a very famous uh, journalist, and uh, uh, from what I've seen, she was pretty well liked by other journalists. Uh, the next one is Philippa Shula, killed in a hospital a helicopter crash after a firefight in Da Nang in May 1967. So she was uh, also going out in the field, uh, and she was on a helicopter during a firefight, and it was shot and crashed. The next one is Marguerite Higgins. She died after catching a parasite on her last visit to Vietnam, 3 January 1969. And if you want to catch a parasite, Vietnam was a great place to go. Uh, if you drank the water, you almost certainly got a parasite. If you ate the food, especially if you ate off the economy, uh, you had a very good chance of getting some kind of parasite. I think the parasites even had parasites. Uh, but she ate or drank something that she wasn't supposed to be doing. I mean, you could wade through a, uh, a river and it pick up parasites. Uh, mosquitoes could, uh, I mean, all kinds of ways. That's why we, every day, we took our malaria to taps once a week on Mondays. We had the big orange peels for a malaria. Uh, there were all kinds of things that you could catch that would uh, grow and kill you later. So. Unfortunately, that's what happened to her. Now, this next uh, slide, I, uh, I'm going to wait till I get there, but Carolyn Griswold. Uh, seems to me like she was married to Chevy Chase. No, but that was a different story. Uh, Carolyn Griswold killed in a raid on the Leprosorium in Van Mutuit during Tet 1968. Uh, there are several Leprosorians there in, um, in Vietnam. Uh, I've had several chances to go to one at Ban Matuit. I have not made it there yet, uh, but the, she was killed during the raid there. So she was killed uh, basically in combat. This next one uh, kind of blows me away. Janie A. McKeel shot in ambush, Delot, March 4th, 1963. And no, that's not a misprint. Janie was five months old. She was there. There were missionaries, and she was there, I guess, with her mother, and they were uh, probably attacked or ambushed somewhere along, as it says, ambushed there. Uh, but five months old, I died. Ruth Thompson, killed in a raid, and also in the Leprosoria and banned me to it, February 1st, 1968, which would also be uh, during the Tet Offensive. Ruth Wilting, killed in a raid on the Leprosorian and banned me to it, February 1st, 1968. That again was during Tet. Uh, they, uh, the, the communists attacked the Leprosorium, even though that the Leprosorium was nobody there but missionaries and doctors and so forth. But um, that didn't seem to stop them doing the Tet Offensive. Now, you don't hear a whole lot about uh, women being POWs and so forth, but they were. Evelyn Anderson, missionary, captured and burned to death in Kinkok, Laos, 1972. Her remains recovered and returned to the U.S. The next POW was Beatrice Cosman. She was also a missionary, captured and burned to death in, at the same time, Kinkok, Laos, and her remains were returned in 1970. Uh, returned later, she was uh, killed in 1972. Next one is Betty Ann Olson, missionary, captured during the raid on the Leprosorian and Ban Mutuit, during Tet, 1968. She died in 1968. Was buried somewhere along the Ho Chi Minh Trail by fellow POW Michael Binge. Remains not recovered. Now Mike has uh, been. Uh, he was a POW. For many years, uh, they were moving him down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. If I remember correctly, 
Mike was uh, carried later to uh, uh, Hanoi Hilton. It was a, a POW there, but part of the time he was in the jungles in the tiger cages as a POW. Uh, but this Betty Ann Olson's remains were not recovered uh, because it was buried unmarked grave on the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. The next POW is Elna Ardell the Etty, missionary, captured at the Lepersorium in Banmi Tuick, May 30, 1962, and she still lists as a POW. Uh, we don't know what, nobody has ever heard from her uh, since then. The next POW, a civilian volunteer, was from a group of Knights of Malta, and that was Maria L. Carbier, dental assistant, age 20, died from illness in a POW camp in late 1969, remains never recovered. Uh, she was captured, and uh, the food they were given uh, out in the jungles and so forth, and the conditions they lived in they were out with mosquitoes and, uh, and so forth were just unbelievable. And uh, there's all kinds of diseases she could have got out there, died from malaria or whatever, dysentery from the bad food. But uh, her, she was a POW who has never been recovered. The next one is Hendrika Cortman, nurse. She was a civilian nurse. She was not a military nurse. She was part of the Knights of Malta. Both were, women were assigned to Knights of Malta Volunteer Hospital in the Da Nang area. On 27th of April, 1969, they were lured to a village in Quinsan district by a female communist agent who told them, let's go out and take some pictures of the area. So they went out to take pictures of the scenery and so forth. And in 1986, the communists turned over what they said was remains of Marine Hell as a, as a POW, which was the same time they were captured. Upon examination, it was discovered that they were the remains of Hendrika Cortman. So her remains have been um, uh, returned back to the United States, but the uh, uh, Mary L. Uh, Kerber, Kerber has not been. And the Savari civilians... Uh, civilian entertainer, Kathy Wayne, Australian, murdered by a soldier who was shooting at his commander and hit her. Uh, kind of ironic. Uh, he, uh, he must have been a bad shot or, or whatever, but uh, it's tragic to be there uh, as an entertainer and get killed in crossfire. Uh, can't even, she can't even say that she was killed by the comments. She was killed by someone she was there to entertain. The next uh, lady who was not in the military who died in Vietnam and is not listed on the Vietnam Memorial Wall in any place is Civilian New Zealand Foreign Affairs Ministry. As you can see, all different kind of countries uh, and groups had uh, ladies there. Sister Leslie Cowper died 2 May 1966. She was a member of a New Zealand surgical team based at Quinn Yon. Doesn't tell us how she died uh, at all uh, in 1966. Now, these were the ladies who uh, died as a result of their uh, service to our country and to the organizations they represented. And I mentioned a while ago Operation Baby Lift. Operation Baby Lift was towards the end of the war. There was a lot of babies born to... American soldiers and Vietnamese uh, young ladies. Uh, they were called Amerasians, after American Asian. Uh, but they were not accepted very well in Vietnam. They knew that the fact that they would be even less accepted if the communists took over, and it was obvious that the war was coming to an end and the communists were going to take over. So they were trying to get as many of these babies, Amerasian babies, out of the orphanages as they could get. The orphanages were overrun, uh, had more babies than they had uh, money and facilities to take care of. And the following women, the first plane going off to uh, well, Operation Baby Lift uh, crashed shortly after leaving the, run uh, leaving the runway, which we'll get into in just a minute. But the following women were killed in the crash outside of Saigon, of the C-5A Galaxy, transporting Vietnamese children out of the country on April 4th, 1975. As you can see, it was getting right down to the end. 
All the women were working for various U.S. government agencies in Saigon at the time of their deaths, with the exception of Theresa Dry, a child herself, and Laura Stark, a teacher. Sharon Wesley had previously worked for both the American Red Cross and American Special Services. She chose to stay on in Vietnam after the pullout of U.S. military forces in 1973. Kind of wonder what happened to her afterwards. Now, these are the names of the ladies who all volunteered to get these babies back to the United States where it would be safe. Barbara Adams, Clara Bayot, Noble Bell, Aletha Burtwell, Helen Blackburn, Anne Badoff, excuse me if I pronounce their names wrong, uh, doing the best I can do, uh, Celeste Brown, Vivine Clark, Juanita Creel, Mary Ann Crouch, Dorothy Curtis, Twilla Donaldson, Helen Dry, Theresa Dry, Mary Lynn Ichan, Elizabeth Fugino, Ruth Ann Gasper, Beverly Herbert, Penelope Henman, Barry Varia, Vera, yeah, Hollenbaugh, Dorothy Howard, Barbara Cavilla, Barbara Mayer, Rebecca Martin, Sarah Martini, Martha Middlebrook, Kathy Moore, Marta Mashinchkin, Marion Polgreen, June Polson, Joan Prey, Sonona Randall, Ann Reynolds, Marjorie Snow, Laura Stark, Barbara Stout, Doris Jean Watkins, Sharon Wesley, Lee Mack, Australian, Margaret Moses, Australian. These all ladies died on that first flight out with a plane full of babies. Of all that we have records of, there were 67 civilians killed during the Vietnam War. There were eight military for 75 uh, total to have lost their lives. There were more probably, but we don't have a whole lot of records of all the women who were going there. Uh, the different organizations didn't always uh, register the people going there. But uh, there are 75 that we know of who lost their lives in, in the Vietnam War. During the years of the war, 265,000 women served in American Armed Forces. Of those, 11,000 volunteered and served in Vietnam. Now, they were not all nurses. Total numbers are not known, but many civilian women served in varied roles in Vietnam throughout the war. Many of the women were wounded and most spent, bunker, uh, spent time in bunkers during attacks as well as enduring extreme hardships of daily life in a war zone. Now, when it says 11,000 volunteered, uh, they were not all nurses. There were, uh, we have one of our members that was an engineer. She carried a weapon uh, who worked in an office. There was a lot of other women. But by and large, most of the uh, women who served in Vietnam in the military were, were nurses. Now, officially, the women were not allowed to be in combat. But the problem was in Vietnam... There was no front line. You couldn't be back behind the lines because the, the front lines were wherever you happened to be. Uh, now women are serving in combat and getting the recognition. But a lot of women who served in combat conditions during the Vietnam War, uh, they could come back and say something about it and nobody would believe them. Just like the men who served, many female veterans returned home to post-traumatic stress and much the same community treatment as the men who served. Uh, if they came back and they was and, and in the uniform and so forth, uh, they were tr treated with the same uh, disdain that the American soldier was. On top of that, even if they were to tell someone they were Vietnam vet, most of the time nobody would believe them anyway. Studies show, looking back, that 48% of the women who served had problems with post-traumatic stress at some point, many of those who still do. These women came back after serving our country and basically were just ignored. Uh, 
and so forth. It's, it's a tragedy to, for all these ladies who, the 11,000 women who uh, served, and plus, the, that's 11,000, is not the, that's military, uh, not the civilian ladies who came back and, and put themselves on the line. Now, the Vietnam War Memorial, this is what it looks like. It's in uh, D.C., just over from the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall. It was dedicated in 1993. Uh, it shows uh, one nurse taking care of uh, a wounded guy, another nurse looking for uh, a helicopter uh, to come in, uh, somewhat like if you've seen the North Carolina uh, Vietnam Memorial, which is outstanding itself. Uh, they remind me of each other, uh, except I think ours is better. But this one is basically for all the families lost. It's just not representing the nurses, so forth. Many Vietnam War, uh, many Vietnam War women veterans came home and and never told their friends or colleagues or even their families about their service in Vietnam. Many who did talk about their tour were were looked at in disbelief as women didn't serve in war back then. What do you mean you say you've been over in Vietnam? You couldn't have been in Vietnam. Women aren't in combat. Well, at least eight ladies are on the wall that uh, have, uh, can tell you about that. Uh, many of the women, military and civilian Vietnam veterans, were looked upon and treated with a protest and lack of respect or acknowledgement for their service, as I mentioned. Women brought home many of the same memories of nightmares, illnesses, and chemical exposure as the men. They were exposed to Agent Orange just like the rest of us and so forth. Now, I want to get back to Operation Baby Lift we had a while ago. There was a lot of controversy uh, about Operation Baby Lift, uh, about how much of an orphan these, these children were, even though they were Amerasian, which we'll get into. In the midst of the political fallout, the United States government announced an unusual plan to get thousands of displaced Vietnamese children out of the country. Now, that should say thousands of displaced Amerasian Vietnamese children out of the country. President Ford directed that money from a special foreign aid children's fund be made available to fly 2,000 South Vietnamese orphans to the United States. Amerasian children, children of American soldiers and Vietnamese women were shunned by the Vietnamese community. The orphans of Vietnam were being overrun with these children. Their, their sisters and so forth didn't know what they were going to do with them. There were so many of them coming in. This is the ladies who are putting these babies on the airplane. Uh, as you can see, they were packing them in, uh, two and three to a seat. Uh, they're having to carry them on. Uh, and these are the children uh, that you saw like this on that first flight that crashed. The doomed first flight of Operation Baby Lift. If they had if only known that that first plane just was not meant to be. It came to be known as Operation Baby Lift. The first plane to leave as part of that mission took off on April 4th, 1975, just a few weeks before the fall of Saigon at the end of the Vietnam War. Things were getting kind of hairy uh, all over Vietnam. Just getting around was a chore in itself. But shortly after the flight, a malfunction forced the pilot, Captain Dennis Bud Trainer, to crash land the C-5 cargo plane into a nearby rice paddy. They were still uh, very close. And you see here in the picture uh, where they slid down, and you can see the plane that is the plane and some of the fire and so forth. That's uh, part of the plane, but you can see where it slid and so forth. Um, our next uh, slide is the is Colonel Bud Trailer, the pilot of the first Operation Baby Lift plane, uh, was carrying hundreds of children, many under age two, and so small they had to be carried onto the plane, as you saw from the previous picture. Uh, we bucket brigade loaded the children right on to the steps, stairs into the airplane, Trailer remembers. When the plane's cargo door malfunctioned, they blew out, taking with them a chunk of their tail. There was rapid decompression inside the aircraft. It cut all control cables to the tail, explains Trainer. So I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, and my nose is going down further and further. And we're going faster and faster and faster. I can't figure this out. Somehow, 
trainer managed to stabilize the plane and turn it back towards Vietnam. After that, his only option was to crash landing. The impact was fierce. As he says here, we came to a stop and I thought to myself, I'm alive. And so I undid my lap belt, fell to the ceiling, which gives you the idea that he was upside down, rolled open the side one and stepped out and saw the wings burning. And I thought, oh no, that's the rest of the plane. Of the more than 300 people on the board, the death toll included 78 children and about 50 adults, including Air Force personnel, more than 170 survived. Now, that is a miracle in itself. We talk about the miracle on the Potomac or, or the miracle on, uh, in New York, uh, that pilot landed in that plane. But there was a miracle. This guy uh, lands a plane, uh, it breaks in two, and 170 survived. Another person on the plane was Colonel Regina Ahn. She was a first lieutenant. Uh, she's a colonel now, but she was a first lieutenant in the Air Force during Operation Baby Lift, and this is what she has to say. I will never forget that day, says Ahn. It's as fresh to me right now as it was the day it happened, and I can understand saying that. Children were loaded two to each seat, uh, seat in the troop compartment, she says, but there wasn't room for everyone. Those who didn't fit would make the trip in the cargo area, which is probably a lot of the ones who didn't survive. We put them in little groups and we scurried them to the floor of the aircraft with cargo tie-down straps and litter straps and blankets and pillows and whatever we could find to secure them to the floor, on says. When the cargo uh, doors blew out, on could see the South China Sea through the hole in the back. When the plane crashed, impact split the aircraft apart. I remember thinking, this plane is crashing, and I'm going to live through it. I have to figure out how to take care of everybody once we finally come to a complete stop, On says. The cargo compartment carrying children, civilians, and crew members was crushed. You can see that in the picture of some of the uh, bigger parts of the airplane. But the troop compartment was largely intact. All and other crew members carried the surviving children off what was left of the plane. Now you got to remember, most of those, a lot of those children were babies. The plane's burning, and they had to go into those that debris and find the babies, and and pull them out. Now one of the stories I've got. Let us see. If, yeah, I think I've got it in here. Now, let's just give you some background a little bit on the uh, Operation Baby Lift. At the end of the Vietnam War, the United States hastily uh, evacuated several thousand babies and children in the largest rescue effort in U.S. history. Uh, they were trying to get those admiration babies out. And as you can see in the next picture, they were bringing back, there were people trying to adopt these children. Uh, the lot of controversy was, which I think I've got in here, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it anyway, and I'll just repeat it a little bit, was that were these children actually orphans? Uh, during all the melee, uh, melee uh, what you want to call it, of uh, the end of, the, of South Vietnam as we know it, uh, the communists coming in, people fleeing, uh, mothers giving their children to the orphanages because they don't think they could take care of them, but these children were a uh, large part undocumented, uh, did not have papers and so forth. So uh, there was questions about whether they were truly orphans, <clears throat> whether we had the right to take these children away from their families and their culture. Also at the time, <coughs> excuse me, all of a sudden I got this uh, bug on my throat here. Also at this time, uh, there was problems with African-American babies were not being adopted. And <coughs> I think I might have to. Uh, the problem was they were not being adopted like uh, people thought they should be. So why bring these Amerasian children in when there's right here in the United States that children need to be adopted? They were children of American soldiers by Clark. Excuse me again for coughing in your face here, but all of a sudden my throat uh, got a got that thing in it. Um, 
In the final month before the fall of Saigon, the situation was deteriorating rapidly. Cherie Clark, the Friends of Children of Vietnam, FCVN, represented in Vietnam, recalls that the country was collapsing around us. We had no idea what to expect at all. As you remember, it was in total chaos. Uh, South Vietnamese soldiers were actually uh, taking their uniforms off, putting on civilian clothes so that the communists wouldn't know they were uh, actually uh, soldiers. Provinces, which were like states, were following like dominoes. Catholic and Buddhist sisters were running uh, by boat and road to Saigon with no children. With the children they had found that were abandoned, in other words, they were just going out and collecting children off the street that they couldn't find parents for. With virtually no money in the country, milk was impossible to find, as was medicine. People were running by the plane loads out of the country. We could only think of survival. Uh, the, the Vietnamese, uh, with money, were leaving the country uh, and getting all the airplanes and stuff going out of the country. On April 3rd, through a combination of private and military transport planes, began to fly more children out of Vietnam as part of the baby lift. Numbers vary, but it appears at least 2,000 children were flown to the United States and approximately 1,300 children were flown to Canada, Europe, and Australia. Service organizations coordinating the flights included Holt, Friends of Children of Vietnam, FCBN, Friends for All Children, Catholic Relief Services, International Social, Service, Social Services, International Orphans, and Pearl S. Buck Foundation. In addition to the four to seven day series of, act of official flights, smaller flights on chartered or loan planes continued throughout the months. They had to get all this done within four to seven days of their uh, original plan. Getting the children to the airport in itself was quite a feat. As I mentioned before, all the chaos, the roads were packed with refugees, uh, people tr uh, trying to stay ahead of the communists. Uh, the roads were almost impassable. Uh, there were a lot of them were uh, blown up and, and in bad shape because of uh, the, the uh, fighting going on. But uh, the streets were just, uh, streets of Saigon, uh, listen, today, the most dangerous thing in Vietnam is across the streets of Saigon. And it was even worse then because everybody was running. Didn't know where they were going, but they, everybody was running around going, we got, what are we going to do before the uh, communists get here? Uh, I work for the Americans. The communists are going to kill me. How can I get out? Uh, total chaos. Uh, no plan. Nobody, no, nobody going in and says, okay, you do this and that. It was just kind of, uh, you're on your own. Leanne Thyman, who was, one of these, who was on one of these plans as a volunteer a parent, escorted for 100 babies. Now, moms, just think about what it is if you got one baby or even twin babies when they start crying. Because what do babies do? They eat and poop. And then they poop and eat. I mean, that's what all they do. How would you like to be in charge of 100 babies? Well, she describes the scenes after takeoff in her inspirational book, this, Baby, this Must Be My Brother, and I would suggest that you get that book and read it. The commotion of loading and transporting babies had not allowed us time to feed them. Mm -hmm. 90, now all 90 were awake and crying simultaneously. That had to be interesting. We discovered that we could feed them all we could feed all three babies in a box at the same time by placing them each on their side and propping the bottles on the shoulder of the box. Some sucked the formula down in only one, on only a minutes, while others needed more help. I cradled a baby girl on my, on my folding legs and coaxed her to drink while using my left hand to feed another baby in the box. The nipple fell from the mouth of the lap, baby on my lap. Clearly, she was too weak to suckle. Using both hands, I milk formula from the milk to drop in her mouth. Now, there was probably 300 or so or more children on that plane, and she was responsible for 100 of them. And you can kind of get the idea of, uh, 
of the noise and stuff that was coming on. And I doubt very seriously there was uh, any pampers or that sort of stuff around. Um, if the Vietnamese children wore diapers at all, uh, they were cloth diapers, but uh, I don't remember ever seeing a Vietnamese child with diapers on, so it had to be uh, interesting on the plane. Operation uh, Baby Lift controversy, as I mentioned, the adoption of these children were almost always accompanied by controversy. It seems like everything we do has controversy at some time. Come on, what you do, somebody is going to be not going to like it and complain about it. Uh, there was a rather publicized debate as to whether children were better off in the United States or in the country of their birth. Some people thought they were uh, Vietnamese, so they should stay in Vietnam, where they were half Vietnamese and half, uh, half American. Uh, they just happened to be born in, in, in South Vietnam. Uh, some of this was true concern. Some was perhaps an unacknowledged racism, and some was a reflection of emotions related to war. In other words, there were people coming back and said they're not really Americans. They're, they're Vietnamese. Well, they were half Americans, as I said before. Uh, criticism and hostility came from both ends of the American political spectrum. Uh, the conservatives, the liberals, everybody had something to say about it, and nobody wanted to uh, come out and, and, and say, but definitely, let's get rid of them or don't bring them in. Charges were made that removing child from their homeland and depriving them of their birth culture was American, was American cultural imperialism. Okay. Uh, these children were, again, half Americans. But sometimes during the haste, uh, a child could be wandered away from their mother and all of a sudden picked up as being uh, abandoned and ended up on an airplane in Vietnam. Some people insisted that Vietnamese could have cared for the children had they been left in Vietnam. That is probably true to a point, but uh, you got to remember these children represented American and Vietnamese, and the communists coming in uh, cared less for the Amerasians than the Vietnamese community did, uh, especially those of different races. So the communists would probably, uh, like they did for a lot of their own people, is to uh, murder them. Uh, and, and so forth. There were people opposed to transracial transracial adoptions. Remember, these were the early uh, late sixties, early seventies. On the other hand, there was a discussion on TV as to why people weren't adopting African Americans away children in the U.S. One of the biggest controversies surrounding the baby lift was the circumstances in which some of the relinquishments occurred, as I just mentioned. Uh, during the ladies of, uh, gathering up the babies from the nursery, if a child had to be separated from their parents, uh, they may very well have been on the, uh, end up on the plane because they got just about any child they could find. Uh, documentation for many of the children is one of the casualties of the war and its aftermath. In other words, when things have uh, fell, has fell and uh, things gone to hell in a handbag, as we should say here, that there's not a whole lot of paperwork uh, going, uh, okay, do you have a birth certificate? Uh, do you have a shot record or anything else? It was, let's get the hell out of Dodge before the communists take over. Uh, documentation for many of the children was one of the casualties of the war and its aftermath. Concerns were raised over loss of inaccurate or inaccurate paperwork. In several cases, birth parents or other relatives who immigrated to the United States requested custody of children already placed. That means when the refugees got here uh, from their refugee camps and uh, the Vietnamese, uh, they started looking for these children. They turned over to the sisters in the orphanages trying to, and trying to get them back, even though they had already been adopted uh, quite often by uh, American families. A widely reported class action lawsuit in California, which contended that children were taken from South Vietnam against their wills of their parents resulting in delays in citizenship approval for some families. Well, if you turn your child over to the sisters at an orphanage, uh, you kind of give up to a certain extent of um, whether, uh, whether, that's, uh, whether it's your child or not. And it's hard to ask a uh, two, uh, two or three month old baby, uh, do you want to stay here or do you want to uh, get on an airplane and go to the uh, United States? Operation Baby Lift lasted 10 days and was carried out during the final desperate phase of the war as North Vietnamese forces were closing in on Saigon. 
Although first flight ended in a tragedy, all other flights took place without incident, and baby lift aircraft ferried orphans across the Pacific until the mission concluded on April 14th, only 16 days before the fall of Saigon and the end of the war. Now, a big thank you for all the women who served their country, their fellow men, and, and their God, both civilian and civilian and military, during the Vietnam War. I want to take the opportunity to welcome home and thank you for your service. A lot of times you don't see ladies wearing these Vietnam veteran hats that you see today, but there's a lot of women out there who uh, need to be told, welcome home, and thank you for your service, who, who did serve. Thank you for your service to all the women who served in harm's way today and tomorrow. Now, the next time I want to talk to you about this next uh, thing is this lady did not die in Vietnam, but she was such a special lady, I wanted to make sure that I got her in. Her name was Martha Ray. She was a uh, TV star, uh, Broadway star, movie star, star of just about everything you can think of, made record albums, a little bit of everything. She was also a registered nurse. She was given the honorary rank of Lieutenant Colonel Martha Maggie Ray. Martha Ray was born August 27, 1916, died October 19, 1994. She was an American comic actress and singer who performed in movies and later on television. She was honored in 1969 with an Academy Award as a Jean Hershalt Humanitarian Award, recipient for her volunteer efforts and services to the troops, and Bob Hope was the one who gave her that medal. Uh, beyond being an entertainer, who went to the camps that no other entertainers went to. All the other, quite often the entertainers didn't want to go out to the fire bases, out in the boonies, really far out in the boonies, but Martha uh, would go wherever her uh, soldiers were. Martha Ray was also a trained nurse who interrupted her shows to render medical aid to the wounded. There were times that she was at one camp and found out the camp that she had just left had been attacked after she left and uh, she would go back, volunteer to go back and take care of the troops as a nurse, not just as an entertainer. She would go to any fire base and anywhere in Vietnam to visit the troops and showed no fear and always supported the men. This is uh, the picture here is a very special award. It's the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This is the highest civilian award of, 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 of our government to anybody, and it was presented to entertainer humanitarian Martha Ray. Martha Ray did USO tours when some celebrities refused to go out of fear in Vietnam. Martha Ray won the hearts and souls of the Green Berets while she was there. Later in her life, the governor of California made her an honorary lieutenant colonel in the California National Guard in honor of her service in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. After Vietnam, when the American public had turned their backs on the veterans, Colonel Maggie had a standing invitation to any Green Berets to stop by her home in L.A. She'd fix them a cup of coffee and talk with them for a while. When Colonel Maggie died, she was buried in the military cemetery at Fort Bragg in accordance with her wishes. She is buried along with her Green Berets. The Green Berets line up into her honorary pall to be her honorary pallbearers. The guys placed so many Special Forces coins in her coffin, they had a hard time lifting up in her wake to put it on the uh, webs on the site. I have been to her uh, um, uh, site there in that special cemetery at Fort Bragg. She's buried there, like I said, with her Green Berets. Uh, she loved her Green Berets. She wore the Green Beret. Uh, but I wanted to give you some of the, some of the military awards that she received. Uh, I don't have time to give you all the, all the awards and so forth. I just wanted to kind of give you some of the recognition and awards she's had. The Susie Award, also known as the Eddie Cantor Award. Some of you new, younger guys who don't know who Eddie Cantor was, Eddie Cantor was, look it up in Google. Uh, he was a big entertainer at the time. Letter of con uh, commendation from Major General Lewis W. Walt, United States Marine Corps. Citation of Merit, 
National Ladies Auxiliary of Jewish War Veterans. The Department of the Army Certificate of Appreciation for Patriotic Civilian Service. The National Service Medal from the Freedom Foundation. The Dickie Chappelle Award given to her by the Marine Corps League. Women of the Year, Veterans of the Foreign Wars. Department of Defense, MACV, Military Census Command, Vietnam, Certificate of Appreciation given to her by General William Westmoreland. Woman of the Year, United Service Organization, better known as the USO. Women of the Year from what Amnon said. The Jean Hoche Humanitarian Award by the National Academy of Arts and Sciences. That's the people who do the Oscars. The Oscar presented and was presented to her on April 14, 1969 by Bob Hope during the 40, 41st Academy Awards show. Life membership to 147th Fighter Group, Texas Air National Guard. Special Award for Gallantry, United States Organization Board of Governors. Citation for Dedicated Services, the American Legion. Armed Forces Day Award, USO of New York. The Circus Honored Saints and Sinners Award, P.T. Barnum Circus. Honorary Flight Nurse, United States Air Force, Lieutenant General K.E. Pletcher, Surgeon General of the United States. Department of the Army Outstanding Civilian Service Award, General Creighton Amons, Abrams, who's, who took the uh, place of General Westmoreland as the general in charge of uh, Vietnam. Try a little kind, uh, kindness award by Joy Bishop on the Joy Bishop Show. And again, for you younger kids, look up Joy Bishop. Uh, he had uh, one of the most popular shows. He was uh, a, a famous comedian and so forth. Uh, the first annual Gold Heart Award, Servicemen's Emergency Recreational Volunteer Events, Incorporated. Honorary Woman in the Air Force, McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. Special Silver Helmet Award by the MVETS. Special Award for Gallantry, second time, United States Organization or the USO, Board of Governors. Honorary non commissioned Office Association, NCO Association. Award from the Association of the United States Army, Outstanding Achievement Award, Secret- Screen Actors Guild. Medal of Merit, Veterans of Foreign Wars. Freedom Award, American XPOW Organization. Department of Defense, Distinguished Public Service. Secretary of Defense, Defense Casper Weinberger. Distinguished Service Award, United States Organization, Board of Governors. Again, USO. Living Legacy Award, Women's International Center. Medal of Honor, New York State Veterans Service Agency, Nassau County. Presidential Medal of Freedom, President Bill Clinton. Entertainer of the Year, Non-Commissioned Officer Association. The Molly Pitcher Award, the Four Chaplains Award. Life Membership, Tri-County Council of Vietnam Era Veterans, Albany, New York. Honorary Member of AD 87 to tenth, the 10th Arvin Division, that was a Vietnamese unit. Honorary Member, 1st Cavalry Division Association for Fort Hood, Texas. Honorary Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army Special Forces, the Green Beret. Honorary Colonel, United States Marine Corps. During all this, Martha Ray had a lifetime fear of flying. But because of her passion and her love for her Green Berets, she was required to make tr- numerous air trips. She was a helicopter almost the time, going to different places. Colonel Maggie died of pneumonia at Cedar sinai Medical Center at 1.45 p.m. on 19th of October, 1994, after a long history of cardiovascular disease. She also suffered from Alzheimer's, cataracts, and liver diseases and lost both legs the year before her death due to circulatory problems. This lady gave everything she had just about for the troops, especially the Green Berets that she fell in love with. She was not only was an entertainer, she was a nurse, she was a mother, she was a sister, she was some of everything. Uh, this show tonight has been dedicated to uh, the women who served our country and during the Vietnam War. There's a lot of you out there who did not get recognition. 
I wish I had time to uh, talk about all the wonderful things that you did while you were serving in country. But again, welcome home, and thank you for your service. Thank you for tuning in to our show. Uh, our next show will be in two weeks, and it will be on Me Lai. That is the, uh, when the American soldiers went into the village of Milai. And just stay tuned and, and watch the show. I think you'll learn some things on that one. Again, thank you for being here. Don't go back to the tree Also, uh, okay, uh, my, everything, my boss man here who keeps me straight, which is hard to do. This coming weekend, if you're in or anywhere in the Triangle area, starting Friday morning at 9 o'clock, 9 to 5 on Friday, March 25th. 9 to 5, March, tw excuse me, oh, that's 24. 24. March 25th on Saturday, 9 to 5. March 26th from 12 to 5 o'clock. There will be the Vietnam Experience at the North Carolina History Museum in Raleigh on Eden Street. That's right across from the Capitol. Now, it will be a little about everything that you could think of being Vietnam. The only thing we do not have there, we were going to have there, is the helicopters. The helicopters were scheduled to be there, but it seems that Fox News has a little bit more power uh, than we do. Fox News asked the North Carolina Helicopter Pilot Association if they would take the helicopters to something going on in New York City uh, this weekend. So they are probably on the road now pulling three Hueys down uh, the highway to New York. I'm glad it's them instead of me. But we will have a one-eighth replica of the Vietnam Memorial Wall. We'll have a computer there that you'll be able to get printouts of the names and bios of people on the wall. We'll have dioramas, weapons, uh, vehicles. Uh, we'll have the play, uh, well-respected uh, play. Etchings in stone will be continuously looped, so you can go in and sit down and watch the play all the way through, which is 90 minutes. So you can watch a little bit of it and get up and go see some of the other stuff and come back and see some more of it. Uh, this show will also be showing... Uh, on a 70-inch uh, TV, uh, round-the-clock, continuous loop, uh, all kinds of things going in. It's great for children. Uh, if you're a Vietnam vet, we'd love to have you. If you uh, would like to talk to some Vietnam vets, uh, also come in and talk to them. I've got a lot of guys there who are Vietnam vets, real Vietnam vets, not wannabes. They'll be there. Uh, you can come in and get their stories and so forth. Again, thank you for uh, tuning in and looking forward to... Uh, been in your home next week, next uh, next time, next show. Thanks. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>